Hi, welcome to our show today, and don't go away because we have one interesting guy here. Don Adams, retired FBI agent. Don's a pleasure having you with us. Thank you very much, Ernie. And uh, he was a very effective uh, FBI agent because, look at his size. <laughs> Nobody would tangle this guy. <laughs> I've known Don, I uh, went to school with him at uh, Akron U. And Don, can you tell us a little bit about your background with the FBI? When did you sure. start? I entered on duty uh, in September of 1982, and uh, I stayed there until December of 1993. And then, uh, or, uh, let's, I, I'm sorry, I have to correct that. I started in 62, and I retired in 80, 83 of uh, December. So I had 20, or 22 years, no, I'm sorry, 20 years and three months uh, total time with the FBI. And. Uh, what was the most interesting case you had? Uh, without any question, uh, the John F. Kennedy assassination was probably the most in, uh, important investigation that I conducted during my time there. Can you tell us a little bit about this? One of your friends gave me this, and that intrigued me to get in touch with you. Okay. And I had to go through two different people in order to reach you. Okay. Was there a reason for that? Uh, no, no. Oh, okay. No, no. I'm not secluded or anything. Uh, <laughs> I thought maybe you'd do it a little more undercover no, and uh, no. we'll do a little cloak and dagger. Here. <laughs> okay, can you tell us about what your take is on this Kennedy assassination? Okay, well, let me tell you the story about how I got involved. Uh, in uh, November of, November the 13th of 1963, uh, while I was working in Thomasville, Georgia, I received a telephone call from the agent in charge, and he asked me to conduct a, an investigation, a priority investigation, concerning a man by the name of Joseph Adams Miltier. Uh, he lived in Quitman, Georgia, and he lived with a prostitute over in Valdosta by the name of C.C. Coalfield. And uh, he and three other men had gone to Indianapolis, Indiana, to a meeting of the States Rights Party and, and, uh, the, and there was Ku Klux Klan people there. And uh, in their discussions up there, four of them centered on how uh, they could kill President Kennedy. And uh, one of them was an informant for the Miami Police Department. And in this discussion, uh, they came up with two methods. They said the first one would be that they would kill him when he left Homestead Air Force Base in Miami, Florida, while he was traveling over to the Kennedy compound in Palm Beach. If that failed, then they had a backup plan where they uh, rented an, either an apartment or a, uh, an office uh, at behind Lafayette Park, which is directly across the street from the, from the White House. And they uh, purchased already a tripod with a high-powered rifle and if the Miami operation failed, then they were going to kill him uh, with this rifle as he walked on the grounds. Because I used to see him in Washington all the time, and he was uh, very friendly and, and very open about his movements in that, and he'd be on the front portico of the White House a lot, and uh, so that's what their plans were. Um, as a result of it, I did a full background investigation. I met with uh, Chief Bill Elliott, who was uh, the chief of police in Quitman, Georgia, which is where Miltier lived, and I did this full investigation concerning everything that he uh, touched. I mean, I, I went uh, through all of his background, checked all the police records, uh, found a set of fingerprints for him in the Lowndes County Jail in Valdosta, Georgia, and, uh, and went to all of his places that he went to, high school, and, and uh, got information from that, and the Motor Vehicle Bureau, and everything that we could compile in a normal investigation with a lot more added, uh, we did a very extensive investigation, the chief and I. And then uh, I, we went down in the Lowndes County Jail, found a set of fingerprints for him, uh, took all this information, and then on Saturday he uh, would go out in Equipment, Georgia and stand on the street corner. And he would pass out hate literature of how he felt about the Kennedys, and I mean, he said openly how he, how he, what his feelings were. We then uh, took all of that information. I went to him on that Saturday, and I took a lot of literature from him, and gathered that with all the intelligence information that we had, 
and then uh, I uh, prepared a report or prepared a rough draft report and then hand carried that to Atlanta and gave that to the uh, special agent in charge. Now his request was from the Secret Service. They didn't have agents in uh, Thomasville, Georgia or in South Georgia. They don't, the Secret Ser Service only had about 400 agents and we had 6,000 so they asked us for assistance to see if I could do this work for them. So that's the purpose that I was doing this for, for primarily for the Secret Service. Uh, as time went on, uh, they gathered all this intelligence and uh, they, were, uh, they turned it over to the Secret Service and then on uh, the 22nd, of course, we all know what happened. On, uh, at 12.30 on the, uh, November the 22nd, 63, which was only about a week after I did my investigation, uh, President Kennedy was killed in Dallas, Texas. Because of that, I received a, an important telephone call from the agent in charge in, in uh, Atlanta, and he said, find Miltier right now. We want to know where he's at. We have to know what happened to these four men that were in Indianapolis and what, uh, what they were involved in and see if they were involved in anything concerning this because it was such a timely coincidence uh, between the, the actual discussions that they had and when the assassination took place. So I went to hunt for him and that's what I did. I, I went out to his location in equipment and also to Coalfield's residence in Valdosta and I checked that I spot checked it every month. I mean, every morning, and then at lunch, and then at dinner, or whenever I finished my day's work, I would check that. I checked that uh, from the 22nd uh, through Wednesday the 27th. Never saw him. Uh, he had a Volkswagen bus with all kinds of placards on it where he was supporting Strom Thurmond and saying that he was the man of the future, and that uh, they were very supportive of him. On Wednesday the 27th, at about 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, I went over to spot check the residence, and when I went in to spot check the residence, his Volkswagen bus was there. By our procedures, I'm not allowed to approach him by myself. I have to have backup. So I pulled away and I immediately went to uh, Valdosta and contacted the agent in charge of the Valdosta resident agency, and I asked him if he could help me. So Ken Williams came out to help me. Excuse me, I have a sweating problem, and I apologize for that. I thought you made other guys sweat. <laughs> well, we do that too. <laughs> do you? <laughs> yeah, okay. sure. Uh, so anyway, as a result, uh, by the time I joined Ken Williams from Valdosta, and the two of us went back to Cofield's residence, uh, his truck was gone. So we had no choice but to interview her. So we interviewed her, and then, of course, she told us that he had loaded up the Volkswagen uh, bus and that he was heading north on the Atlanta Highway and that he was going to be gone for some time. So Ken and I went out, we got into our two separate cars and we took off and we went north and we went about 60 miles before we finally encountered the VW bus. And I rolled around him and I pulled him over to the right side of the road and, and I jumped out of my car and I went right back and opened up the door and took him out of the vehicle and then put, put him alongside the vehicle and shook him down to see if if he had any weapons, which is the procedure that we follow all the time. Because the most paramount thing that we have to worry about is our own safety. And, and that comes first. And once I, I checked him over in that and found the weapons, then I told him we were going to take him back to Valdosta for the purpose of interview. And, uh, and we did that. We, we uh, had his VW bus uh, pulled in or towed in by the, secret, I mean by the uh, State Highway Patrol and then uh, we rolled on down into Valdosta and went to the resident agency for the purpose of conducting that interview. Uh, I interviewed him uh, with instructions by the agent in charge as to what the specific questions were to be asked. And I remember saying to the agent in charge, well, gee, that's really unusual. Why can't I just ask him all kinds of questions? Why can't I ask him, you know, where he's been and who he associates with and gather all the intelligence that we possibly can get on him? And I, I didn't get that, and, uh, and he said, no, I only want you to ask these specific questions, and that's it, and nothing else. So as a result of it, uh, we did that. And when we finished the interview, then uh, he denied any involvement in the assassination, said he had no discussion about it or anything, and as a result of it, then he was released 
uh, and the agent in charge said that the Secret Service, if they needed him, they would get a hold of him and, and, and uh, talk with him. So that was the end of it. I mean, from that point on, I had no more contact excuse me, I had no more contact with uh, anything to do with Miltier until 1992. And then in 1992, a friend of mine from Houston, Texas, came back up and he was visiting with his family here in Akron, and uh, he, and we were invited to the house for a Christmas weekend uh, get-together one evening, which we did every year. And while we were there, uh, their son Larry came over to me, the fellow that's down in Houston, and he said to me, gee, I hear you that you're involved in the Kennedy assassination, and I would love to talk to you about it. He said, I'm a Kennedy buff, and I want to know everything that's going on. So I said, fine, Larry. So I sat there, and we talked in the kitchen table, and when we finished, everybody that was in the house for the Christmas festivities and that ended up at the table in our discussion. I mean, they all wanted to hear what I was talking about. And uh, he then left and went back to Houston. About a month and a half later, I was working in a company in Akron, and I received a package, and my secretary said to me, Mr. Adams, a package came in while you were at lunch, and it's on your desk. So I went in, and I opened up the package, and then there was a book, and it was called High Treason. And in that book, High Treason, written by Groden and Livingston, co-authored by those two fellows, uh, he had a pasting note inside the cover, and it said, uh, Joseph, because I never mentioned his n name, his last name, to anybody in the discussion. I always talked to him about Joseph A. And he said, Joseph A. is mentioned in the, in the uh, details of the, of the book. And I thought, you know, that can't possibly be, because there could have been a hundred Joseph A.'s that were involved in that assassination as e extensive as it was. So I went to the appendix, and when I went to the appendix, there was his name, Joseph Adams Miltier. And it shocked me. And then it showed that there was a reference to the appendix B in the back of the book. And I went to the back of the book, and when I went to the back of the book, there was, there was written in there a tape-recorded conversation that took place between Miltier and the informant who was with them up in, in uh, Indiana. And in that tape-recorded conversation, which was done by the Miami Intelligence Police Unit, based on their cooperation with the, I mean, with the, the, the informant Somerset, they had uh, established and set up this recorder in, in Somerset's apartment, and, and Miltier didn't know that he was being recorded. Somerset engaged him in conversation, and in the course of conversation, he said something that shocked me to no end, because on November the 9th, of uh, 63, two weeks before the assassination, Miltier said that they were going to kill President Kennedy out of a tall building with a high-powered rifle. And you can imagine when I had done this investigation in, in 1992, for the first time learned this information that was never told to me by the FBI or the Miami Police Department or anyone else. Well, why? I, I can't tell you that. I don't know. I, there's a lot of, there's a lot of secrecy and a lot of uh, activities on this thing that's coming out now that we're looking at this thing. And I can't tell you that, Ernie. I don't know. Well, I, because you don't know or you can't? It's not I uh, can't. It's just that I don't know the answers to it. And are there suppositions, for example, where did it come, the information come or the instructions to you to ask only these questions? From the agent in charge. And then who would give him the information or the orders to do that? I see that I don't know. It might have come from, it'd go up? It might have gone up the ladder, yeah, and come down, right. And so as a result of it, because the normal procedure is for them to give us, uh, a normal procedure is for them to give us all the intelligence that they have compiled on him. And I should have had all that information concerning that tape recorder, and I never did. Hang on to that riveting story. I'm sitting on the edge of my seat okay. here, and uh, we'll be right back after this message. Okay, Don, continue. Okay. Uh, as a result of it, uh, we then, uh, I, I, like I said, this was in 1992. I then started doing a full background to try to find out the answers to this myself, because when you look at the book and you see see this story that's written in the appendix and he talks about doing this, if you have that intelligence knowledge ahead of time, then you certainly don't permit this man to go to Dallas, Texas, to a place where there's tall buildings where they could kill him with a high-powered rifle. 
But when you don't have that knowledge, then of course there's nothing that you can do to stop that. So I, I continued uh, uh, sticking my nose into it and trying to find out what happened. And I'm retired from the FBI and I'm, I'm the chief of police in Fairlawn at this time. And uh, so I started doing everything that I possibly could to find out what is really going on here. I, excuse me, I then went uh, into the uh, high treason uh, book that was written, as I told you, and in the photograph section uh, in the middle of that book is a, uh, a picture of Miltier and Somerset on the top pages, a top of page of, of this photograph section. And below that is a picture of Miltier standing by a streetlight looking at the president's limousine just moments before the president was killed. So Miltier had gone to Dallas, Texas, and then we learned that at 10 o'clock that morning, he called the informant Somerset and told Somerset, I'm here in Jackrabbit country, your friend's coming here, and you're never gonna see him again. And when I read all this and saw the photographs, the actual photographs of the man that I knew, that I interviewed and did the background, it shocked me beyond any reason that could be as far as, you know, what really happened here. Why did this occur? Did these guys get off? Are they still alive? Uh, no, they're dead now. Uh -huh. they, they passed away and, and uh, uh, Miltier uh, died sometime in the 70s, mid 70s, and then Somerset, I think, died uh, in the late 70s. They never said a word? Or just... No, no. And why, why all this mishmash about the single bullet theory that bounced around and well, here. got both people? Uh, there is just so much of this, that's what I'm trying to tell you, this, mm -hmm. is, this is such a lengthy story. Normally when I give a talk on this, it usually takes two and a half hours to make my presentation. So when we have to skinny it down, you miss so much, but on the single bullet theory, uh, they said it was a pristine bullet that uh, went through two people, hit bones and matter, and if anyone has any intelligence about, sh uh, about shooting a weapon, and that uh, when a round hits an object, it tears off some of the lead. And there was a lot of lead uh, in Governor Connolly's uh, body where this pristine bullet uh, reportedly or allegedly had hit him. And uh, no one has ever been able to prove that uh, that bullet did that damage to him. And when he died, they wanted to remove uh, the lead fragments from his body some had already been taken at the early surgery uh, right after the shooting, and, uh, and they wanted to take that lead, but Mrs. Connolly said no, she didn't want that to happen. So no one really got the answer to it, but if you look at the pristine bullet, it's just as clean as can be, and, and I don't think that there's very little, I don't think there's very much of the lead that's missing off of the, off of the bullet. Um, Again, why is that story uh, manufactured? I'm going to say this to you, and my personal belief is, based on everything that I have done, that the pristine bullet is a lie. I don't think that that ever happened. I don't think that, I don't think that Oswald ever shot uh, President Kennedy from the loft on the sixth floor. Was he involved with these guys some way? Yeah. He, uh, <clears throat> see, the ironic part about it is he was killed by Jack Ruby on, on Sunday, as everyone knows, at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, yet, we're now finding out where uh, there's a book that is just out now written and it's called uh, Dr. Mary's Monkeys. And in Dr. Mary's Monkeys, there's a story in there about how Oswald and, and Ruby worked together in or New Orleans and knew each other. And then there was earlier reports where, where Jack Ruby and uh, Oswald were I mean, we're at the, or they were at the uh, Carousel Club, uh, which was owned by Jack Ruby, a week before the assassination. The two of them together. You say work. Now, meaning what? How did they work? Were they work with the CIA? Well. Or the government? I mean, here, mm -hmm. think about, about your question, Ernie. Here's a guy that worked in the most uh, top secret air base in, in the world where we were doing the flyovers uh, over Russia where uh, Gary Powers was stationed at, at Sugi, Japan, I believe is the, is the island that he was on. Lee Harvey Oswald worked in there. You don't get a clearance of that caliber to work in a facility like that and then all of a sudden go to <clears throat> defect to Russia and say that you no longer are an American and that you don't want any part of this country. And then 
surprisingly get married over there and a short time later, two years later, whatever it was, he comes back to our country with no repercussions or anything. And he ends up in New Orleans and he's working with a retired FBI agent who was the former agent in charge in the Chicago FBI office and, and, and Oswald's working with him uh, in New Orleans and that's where Jack Ruby in this most recent publication was mentioned that he was there with him, which I didn't know until just recently. That's a 2007 publication. Uh, he then moved to Dallas, Texas, and where does he end up at? But the Texas Book Depository. So I I believe that that he was working for some agency, some government agency, and was doing what he did, and and also had connections with the mob, and also had connections involved in trying to kill Castro, and as a result of it was assassinated uh, by Ruby. To keep him quiet, and then Ruby uh, stayed in jail. Uh, Warren and Gerald Ford, the congressman, uh, went to Dallas to interview him, and he said, "Ruby said to them, as they were finishing their conversation, if you take me out of here and get me out of Dallas, and take me back to Washington with you, I will. I'll give you the whole story." And they closed the door of the of the jail and walked out and left him there. So all of these things, and there are so many, I could just go on and on about how many different things that are happening as far as uh, even the firing of the weapon, the man like a Carcona rifle that, that uh, Oswald allegedly had killed the president with. If you take that bolt action rifle, which has a scope on it about the size of a quarter, and you aim that weapon and, and, you, and you hit your target, on the first shot you can do that. But then you got to bolt action the cartridge out of there and then seat another cartridge when you're moving this weapon and then put that scope back up and, and get it into your eye. And you know as well as I do, if you get a pair of two big optics on a pair of binoculars and you look at a plane or a bird or something and drop it for a second and then try to pick it up again, it's almost impossible to do that. And here he fired three rounds in seven and a half seconds and allegedly had killed the president and shot Connolly. Connolly says, four days or five days after he was shot, I was hit separately. I was hit. Kennedy was hit first in the throat. And then I was hit. Then Kennedy was hit. And then I was hit. And so that knocks out the pristine bullet automatically as far as going through the two of them. And, and they had to move in a book called uh, Murder in Dealey Plaza by uh, Dr. Jim Fetzer. He mentions in there that uh, they had to move the wound that President Kennedy had in his back five inches down and two inches to the right of his spine, and he had to move it up to uh, the height to his neck to make that, that hole that was in the front to make it the pristine bullet and make it work, okay? But now what you don't realize is, is that as the car is moving down Elm Street, uh, if you look at the Zabruder film, the President puts his hands up to his throat instantly. And that's when he got shot in the front. There was a windshield. <coughs> uh, the windshield was cra uh, cracked in, and a bullet hole in the windshield of the limousine. They went to great extremes and took that vehicle all the way to Dearborn, Michigan, to the Ford Motor headquarters and had the uh, windshield removed and put a new one into there. Uh, they didn't want to talk about the bullet hole, but the four, three or four doctors and the people that were in the, that were in the trauma room in Parkland Hospital they said that there was no question that he had a bullet hole in his throat, and when they did the trach on him and had to give him the opportunity to breathe better, uh, they saw this bullet hole. Now, one other thing I want to mention so that it's vivid in your minds is if you take a look at President Kennedy laying on the gurney in Dallas, Texas at, at the trauma room, uh, he's laying there and his face is totally intact. Everything. Now, there was alterations that were done on the back of his head, and everyone, there were 17 people there, and they said that he was hit, the main shot hit him in the temple and blew the back of his brains out uh, and uncovered his cerebellum. And that was done by like 17 different people who were witnesses. And yet, the Warren Commission poo pawed that and said that it was the pristine bullet that killed the president. But if you take a look at if a round is, if a round is shot from the sixth floor of the book depository down onto Elm Street and hits the president in the back of the head, it's going to blow his face out. 
and his face was totally intact, laying on the gurney after he had died. So there's just a number of little items of things that people don't pay attention to. There's a lot of people that have looked at this, but uh, they didn't realize uh, when you start compiling everything and putting, to, to, put, putting it together, then you get a true picture of what's happening. And we're in the process of doing that now, um, of working on this and, and uh, trying to uh, give some idea to the public that, that this total investigation by the Warrant Commission was a farce and that Oswald uh, was not the shooter. Oswald was on the second floor drinking a Coke and, uh, and when the police officer and the superintendent of the building confronted him, t just seconds after the firing took place and they heard the reports and these two men ran up in there and they went to the break room and he's standing there drinking a half drunk Coke. He's not perspiring, not breathing heavy or doing anything. And, uh, and they say that he's the man that shot him. But he would have had to travel four floors down to get to the break room, would have had to stop what he was doing because he ran all the way to the front of the building, hid the weapon under some boxes, ran across the building, and then went four flights and then went to the Coke machine to drink. So well, I, I, I excuse don't, me. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're running yeah, out of time. time here, but can I ask for a conclusion on this? Where, how high does this go? Well, I'll, I'll and, let you answer that yourself by the way I answer this. Uh, if, you, if you take a look at, uh, for example, what Ernie asked about the control of the interview as to what is to be asked on the interview, and if you take a look at all of the work that was done to prove that Oswald was the shooter, uh, and, and we did the work, the FBI did the work, okay, and if you start compiling all of that information, you start realizing that, that the FBI did not do their job properly, and I say that in my writings and in my, in my talks. And I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that because the Bureau is an outstanding organization and they do a masterful job in their investigations, but they didn't do it in this job. And so when you start, you change the, the route that was, I mean, common sense dictates to you the quickest way to get from point A to point B is the way you want to move the president. And here they come down and they make a 90 degree turn onto Houston Street, and then they make a 120 degree turn onto Elm Street and put him right in front of the book depository, and they just change that route uh, like uh, hours or, or maybe a day before the Dallas Police Department, the Chief of Police, and, and the head of the Secret Service. So when you take a look at this as to the way co the Secret Service conducted themselves, the way the FBI conducted themselves, and other law enforcement agencies, the Dallas Police Department, and everything, uh, I say that it goes right to the top. From the top down. That's the way I feel. That's my personal opinion. One more question. <clears throat> Will you have any problems, or did you have any problems with the agency I'm, on doing this program? I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if I will or not. I've been doing it now for uh, since 1992 when I was the chief, and I started giving my talks, and I've given probably over 40 talks now concerning this. Uh, the agency knows. I sent them the information mm -hmm. and told them the story of what my investigation is about, and uh, they elected not to publish it in the FBI uh, retired agents uh, book. And I, I sent the, all that material to them, so they know about it. 